Babies do grow. They become like that and like this. How's everyone tonight? Good. By God's grace, we'll be better after we're done with the study. So let's pray. Uh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we open up this Bible, Lord, and we thank you for it. We thank you that in it, Lord, we find life and eternal life. We know, Lord God, it won't make us rich and it won't make us famous, but it'll be good for salvation and it's profitable for eternal life. And so, Lord, we praise you and thank you. Thank you for the men and women, Lord God, who guarded this word and brought it to us in our language. And we thank you, Lord, for those who taught it to us and who first mentioned it and brought it to our attention. And through your spirit, Lord, we were drawn to it, to the truth and to love you and to know you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he hung in our place, bore our sins and shame on that tree and brought us to Father. And thank you, Lord, that you left us your Holy Spirit after your ascension and resurrection, Lord. We thank you so much that you promised to return and to, and to bring back, Lord God, your kingdom to establish on earth. And we thank you for all these things, Lord God, as we study this book, um, this book of Jonah. Many Jews this past few months have read it, and uh, they'll continue on living their lives. And there's many people in churches who would go on reading the Bible and and never really getting it, Lord, but help us to get it. Help us to understand the meaning of this book. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 4. I do agree with scholars that if Jonah would have ended in chapter 3, it would have been a great story, uh, because chapter 3, it's the great revival in Nineveh. About 2 million people repent and believe. And Jonah comes back to the Lord and he preaches and people get saved. It would have been a wonderful, wonderful ending to the book. However, it is not the end of the book. We have chapter 4. And out of the four chapters, I do have to agree, it is the most difficult chapter to preach on. Because it doesn't seem to be clear why, first of all, why does the Bible let us know the story? After a great revival, there is an aftermath and a prophet and a preacher who is upset that people became saved. I have never heard of a preacher or a prophet who was angry that people responded to the message, and yet we have one here. And there is a man angry with God and talking to God and correcting God. Why do we have this chapter in the Bible? It would have been a sweet ending if it was only to chapter 3. But it's chapter 4, and God saw to it to give us this chapter for various reasons. And um, the Bible is very, very honest and personal. And I think it's one of the reasons I believe the Bible was true when I became a Christian is that it did not hide human nature. It told us exactly how humans are. If it was written by some religious group, it would have left this chapter out of the, uh, out of the book because it would seem to be in a bad light. But the Bible gives us everything. Warts and all, we would say. The good, the bad, the ugly... And um, Jonah here is, comes across very an interesting character. Maybe we come up with exactly why he was angry. And I'll give you some options of what good Christians along the history of the church have said, uh, because this chapter is very debated. Why is he upset? Why did he not want to go? And I think there's some really some good hints about um, why Jonah was angry uh, that the Ninevites came to salvation. So let's read verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall, I went to Tarshish. I fled to Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness uh, or mercy, and one who relents concerning calamity or judgment. Therefore, now, Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And Lord, and the Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat to the east of it. There he made a shelter, literally a booth, for himself and sat under the shade until he could see what would happen to the city or in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from the discomfort, and Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm 
when, when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. And it came about when the sun came up that God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged him with all his soul to die, saying, Death, it is better to me than life. What would drive a man to that point? That's, that's, a, that's the question of the day. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. And the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, in which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. And should I not have the compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who did not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. That's it. It sort of ends in, a, in, a, in an abrupt way, and we'll talk about that. But chapter 1, I think it's really easy. A prophet who is rebelling against God and goes the other way. I've met people like that even today. They know better, they know God's calling them, and they keep running the other way. So that's not hard to imagine. Chapter 2, a man is drowning to the point of death, and God brings him back in the resurrection. And if you believe the resurrection of Jesus you won't have a hard time understanding that God can raise people from the dead. Uh, and by the way, chapter 1 chapter one, and chapter 4 are connected in a sense of uh, Jonah is acting the same way. He's rebelling in chapter 1 and he's rebelling in chapter 4, right? like bookends, right? And chapter 2 and 4 are connected because they're opposites, right? Chap chapter 2, Jonah is praising God and thanking God for what he's done in his life. Chapter 4, he's complaining, and he's griping about what has happened. So we get extremes in Jonah's character, an extreme in Jonah's life. And uh, there, it's no, no coincidence that Simon, son of Jonah in the New Testament, had similar patterns. You see that Jonah, or Peter, son of Jonah, in one moment he could say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, God revealed that to you. And the very, very next communication with Jesus, he's trying to keep Jesus from the cross. And even Jesus says, Satan, get thee hence. So in one sense, Simon speaks in a very good light of the Lord. And in the other sense, he's almost preventing Jesus from going to the cross. Why the extremes? Well, the character of Jonas, it's seen a lot in Peter. Extreme opposites. Used by God, runs from God. Gets close to God runs away from God, and I don't have to look much further than my own life to see how much of Jonah is still left in me. And I think that's what, probably one of the points of the book. Chapter 3, it's a very easy chapter. It's a great city with a great message, one sentence, great repentance. But chapter 4, it's something else. <laughs> chapter 4 almost doesn't make sense why it's in this book, and there's a lot of scholars that said that's, that's it would have been great chapter 3, but chapter 4 goes on. The word but comes up here in this very, very first verse. But it greatly displeased Jonah. Another great. Remember the great, the great city, the great fish, the great storm? Now we have a great displeasure, a great anger from Jonah. And the word but is there to show you the contrast. So we see that word there is God's doing something, but Jonah's doing something else. And you see that all through the book. From chapter 1, it says, God called Jonah, but Jonah went to Tarshish. God called him to go to Nineveh, but Jonah went to Tarshish. But then God had a but too. It said, but God brought a great storm. So when you have people or ourselves running away from God, our, our lives is really a lot of buts are happening in our own lives. B-U-T. And that is the consequences of our own behavior when we rebel against God. There's always a but. God's always trying to do something in us. We run away. God does this, and we do that. Then God does another thing, and then we run away from it. Then God brings us back. And it's just ebb and flow of inconsistent life that happens to Christians that are not settled in, on the call of God in their lives. And this is a great lesson in Jonah. But let's continue. It's unbelievable to me how this chapter is, is made up because uh, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a preacher become so angry at people getting saved and then get angry at God. Uh, let's look at verse 2. He prayed to the Lord and he said, Please, Lord, this is what I said when I was still in my own country. 
Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents in calamity. One of the things we're going to see here as we read Jonah is, of course, looking at Jesus in this chapter. And like I said before, no scripture, no Christ. No Christ, no scripture. If we're going to find the scriptures, you're going to find Jesus. And if you find Jesus, you're always going to point to the scripture. And you're going to have a, a very, very important lesson in Jesus in this chapter, sort of a un, um, unconventional. It's, it's a type of Jesus that's going to come up that most of us don't talk about, but it's a very, very important type of Jesus here. And of course, we're talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's sort of our journey with God through the Old Testament, into the New Testament, unto eternal life. Always keep that in mind when you're reading the Bible. We're always moving toward the New Jerusalem. This is part of it. Reading Jonah and reading through the Bible helps us understand where we're going, where we've been, the people of God, where we are today, and where we're going. Always keep that in mind with the New Testament and Old Testament in your mind or in your ears. Always reading the New balancing it with the old and vice versa. So we always have a balanced view of the Lord. But this is Jonah, of course. He's been in the fish. Now he's in, not in the warm, but he's going to deal with the warm. And uh, we've talked about Jonah quite a bit, and I'm not going to go through the whole study again, but a very important type of Israel, called by God to be a servant of God, to be a proclaimer of God's word, runs away. A very important type of Jesus, very much the resurrection of, of Jonah, it's in line to what Jesus said. Just like Jonah was in, the heart of the, uh, was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so will be the Son of Man, will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And that was a point that Jesus pointed to, a sign that people would have in order to understand Jesus. The resurrection of Jonah was the sign that God would give. Another important sign of Jonah was that Gentiles will come to faith. There are two significance to Jonah in the New Testament. One, the resurrection of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, that's the point. When Jesus says in Matthew 12, look to Jonah. You desire a sign, a wicked and perverse generation always seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given except the resurrection. In Luke, it's not the resurrection that's the point. It's that Gentiles repent faster than Jews which is the whole story of Jonah. While this is happening in Nineveh, a great revival, great repentance, guess what's going on in Israel? Great apostasy, tremendous idolatry, horrific, gone away from the Lord, immorality, wicked kings, and we'll look at one today, hopefully. But in Nineveh, they're all repenting. And that's the point that Jesus was making in Luke. The sign that you'll see that Jesus is the true Messiah is that Israel will be slow to repent and Gentiles will pick it up and run with it and become believers in Jesus. So you see it in the book of Acts. You see Jews coming to faith in Jesus at the beginning. And as we get to chapter 9 and chapter 10, which, by the way, we're going to be at the uh, Your Belinda Bible Study this Sunday night, sort of a special Sunday. Um, we're going to be teaching on uh, Paul going out to the Gentile world in chapter 10, chapter 11. But here in Jonah's day, the Ninevites were repenting, not the Jews, which it's part of Jonah's connection to all this. So let's keep reading. Verse 2. Please, Lord, I told you this already. <laughs> it's basically what Jonah's saying. I knew uh, when I was in Israel, I was still in my country. Was not this what I said? We get a peek into a conversation that we're not told in chapter 1. We have a peek into a conversation he had with God. God called him to go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, no. <laughs> no, Lord, I told you. But why? See, the question is always this, why? Well, here's a peek. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I went to Tarshish. I knew you called me to Nineveh, but I went to Tarshish, for I knew, and this is the key part, that you are a gracious God, a merciful God, a compassionate God, a slow to anger God, an abundant loving kindness God, and one who relents in doing evil. There's five things he says about God. You're gracious, you're merciful, you're slow to anger, right? And it's kind of interesting because these are the opposites of Jonah, right? Jonah wasn't so gracious. He wasn't so merciful. God is slow to anger. 
Jonah was quick-tempered, right? He's so different than me and, and you and I, huh? We could be so hot-headed. We could be so angry quickly, uncompassionate, unmerciful to people, uh, abounding in love or steadfast in love in another translation, right? Abundant in loving kindness. That idea has to do with loyalty. God's love is not just a, a feeling of love. It's loyalty. God's going to stick with you. That's his loving kindness toward us. He's faithful to you. That's how he demonstrates his love. By the way, that's really the word for faithfulness. That's really the word for faith. And in the Bible, it's described that way. Loyalty. Not just faith as a belief in your head or in your mind, but a commitment to a person. I'm not leaving you. I'm staying with you. You can apply that to your marriage. You can apply that to your faith. That's the word that God uses for himself. A faithful God, a loyal God. Uh, the other one is that he relents from evil. God can change his mind if people repent. In one sense, he can say, if you don't repent, I'm going to bring calamity. Now, he knows whether or not that person will repent. From our perspective, God relents, and he does. He says, if you don't repent, there'll be your sins will find you out. But if a person repents, then God doesn't bring calamity. Right? It would seem that God doesn't know which way we're going to go. Of course he does. But the reality of it is he, his behavior and his relationship toward you can change based on our response to his message. And that's what he said. You don't want to bring calamity. You are the one who relents in bringing judgment to people, meaning God doesn't want to judge people. He prefers not to judge people. He'd rather see them saved. He'd rather forgive them. God delights in forgiveness. He doesn't delight in judgment as uh, some unbelievers and atheists and groups like that make God to be this you know, bloodthirsty, vicious God. The Bible actually says God does not want to judge. He only judges because he's holy and righteous and good, and that's what he has to. But he would rather see people saved. He weeps at the fact that people die and go to hell. Uh, God doesn't want that. He didn't prepare hell for people but for Satan and his angels. So people go there out of their own volition and choice, but God doesn't want them there. Therefore, Jonah says, I knew you're a good God, and I didn't want to go because you're good. Now, isn't that a strange, a strange justification for not, not going? We'll find out why he said that, because there's a reason, right? There's a reason why he said that. I knew, God, that you were going to forgive them. So before I went to Nineveh, I knew if the people repented, you would meet them, you would grab them, you would hold them, and you would forgive them. And if they took one step toward you, you you'd take ten steps toward them. I knew you were like that, God, and therefore I didn't want to go. That's a good, interesting question, because the question still lies, why did he not want to go? Verse 3, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life. I would rather die. Death is better to me than life. And the Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? Not why are you angry, but do you have a good reason to be angry? And this is, you can have a choice here. I will tell you what good Christian, godly, godly commentators have said over the centuries on why Jonah didn't want to go. And you'll have five choices, and I'll tell you which one's mine. I'll leave mine for the end so you'll know which one it is. And, uh, but you can pick any one of them, and God bless you. If, if you like the other ones, no problem with me. You love them. Number one, it was a personal reason. Jonah did not want to go because being a prophet, being a prophet, he would predict the future, not only prophesied in terms of preaching, but also predict the future. And if he said that 40 days that they'll get yours, 40 days will be overthrown, and the people repented, he, his prophecy will not come true. So some people have said that's the reason why he was upset that people repented, and so he did not prophesy. That's what people have said. Commentators have said. Now, I don't agree with it because it doesn't seem to fit in what Jonah said. I'm only basing out what Jonah said, but I'm telling you what other commentators have said. Number two, it was a political reason, meaning that Nineveh was the growing empire of the day, and he was absorbing all these other countries around them, and Israel happens to be the next place in town where they were being absorbed, sort of like the Soviet Union during the Cold War era. 
that was absorbing this, uh, the Eastern Bloc of Europe, Romania and Yugoslavia and all these countries, and the Soviet Union was absorbing this. And Israel was one of those satellite nations that Assyria could have invaded, and they did. And therefore, it would seem like he would be siding with the enemy if he went over there and preached the message. It's sort of like, let's say, our enemies, the terrorist organizations, and, and God will call you to preach the message to ISIS or in Afghanistan or Pakistan or in Turkey, and you would go there and you would preach a message, and the whole nation of Turkey, or the whole nation of wherever and your imagination takes you, North Korea, the whole nation of North Korea would become saved, and you would be like, man, these are the people that hate us. These are the people that use us. These are the people that are bad to our people. And Jonah did not want to go there for political reasons. Now, I'm only telling you this is what people believe. Commentators have said, you can, you can make that case. Uh, I don't agree with it, but you can make that case. The third one is the racial one, a racial uh, justification, meaning that Jonah is a Jew, and they are Gentiles, and therefore he cannot imagine Gentiles receiving the Jewish God. He's our God, not your God. Therefore, we want our God to stay in our borders, and we, you, know, you keep your pagan deities, we'll keep our one true God. And that's why Jonah did not want to go. It was a racial one. Number four, and you can pick that one too, uh, it was a mental one, meaning that Jonah, according to some commentators, is the first of the pharisaical line that we see in the New Testament. He was like a Pharisee who, although he had salvation, he would be upset at other people receiving salvation easier than how he got salvation. And so he would be in the lines of the Pharisees or where he would be a prophet and he would be dedicated to God. And, and these pagans, you know, these pagans, they don't even know who God is, and all of a sudden God's going to forgive them. And, and what about us? We've been serving God for all these years. And so you could see uh, Jonah being like maybe the, the, the oldest son against the prodigal son, right? The oldest son who had been around for a while and everything that, that belonged to the father belongs to him. But you're going to receive this guy? He's been around messing around with people, and you're just going to forgive him just like that? So that's one reason people say that Jonah was angry. So you got those four, and God bless you if you want to pick any of those, and that's fine. The one I believe it's the correct one, not because it's mine, but because I think it fits with the passage, is Jonah was so dedicated to God, he did not want people to take advantage of God's grace because he had been through this before. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 14. Let's go to the other place where Jonah is found. Most people forget that Jonah is found in the Old Testament twice, and he's found in the New Testament. Of course, Jesus talked about it, but in 2 Kings 14, we have an interesting, sort of by the way, but it's a, it's a, it's a pretty important story, I believe, in terms of what happened to Jonah. Verse 21. 2 Kings chapter 14. And it says, but, Elath in, uh, but he built Elath and restored to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, another king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, which he made Israel sin. So you have to go back to the beginning of that kingdom split, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom seemed to be more faithful to God. They had the temple, they had Jerusalem, they had the high priest, they had the law of Moses. The northern kingdom had Jeroboam, and Jeroboam was the general of Solomon, and Jeroboam wasn't a good guy, and he actually caused Israel to fall into major idolatry. He built two great centers of worship. He did not want people to go to Jerusalem. He built one in the, in the southern part, and he built one in the northern part. And he put two golden calves in that area, Samaria and then one in Dan. And, the other, and, and he made those two golden calves to be the centers of worship. And he told them, these are your gods that delivered you out of Egypt. And the people worshipped the golden calf, and Jeroboam made the people sin in a big way. Well, here it tells you that this man 
Jeroboam um, had, uh, had done the same thing. This man had done the same thing, and he had caused people, uh, had caused the people of Israel to sin. Verse 25, he restored the borders of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Nefer. So here we have an interesting story of a man named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam was an interesting guy. He was not a good king, and he caused Israel to sin in a major way, just like the kings of Israel. But he had a prophet, and the prophet was Jonah. And Jonah went to, Rehobo, uh, to Jeroboam one day by the word of the Lord, and God said, your kingdom is going to expand. You're going to have a greater land. Now, during the time of Jeroboam, the kingdom was shrinking. Israel was shrinking because all these other nation states were kind of taking land from Israel. But God gave a promise to Jeroboam through Jonah that God was going to bless him and God was going to expand his kingdom. And it did. Now the question was, did that cause Jeroboam to change? No. In fact, it says he did, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, what do you think Jonah thought about this? He just went to preach a message that God's going to bless you. God's going to expand your borders. And he turns around and he spits in God's face. Well, that did something to Jonah. He did something to Jonah and that Jonah did not want to go through this again. That's what he said to God. God, I knew you were a good God. You're slow to anger, compassionate, relenting calamity, good, faithful. People take advantage of you, Lord. And I can't bear it anymore. I am not going to go through this again. And this is why I believe Jonah did not want to go. He had been burned once by his own people, meaning that they sh he should expect the king to turn and repent. Doesn't the goodness of God bring man to repentance? Not always, is it? People sometimes take advantage of how good God is. And they just want to hear the good news. Say, I just want to hear that God's going to bless me. They have no interest in changing lives. They have no interest in changing a heart. And so Jonah had been burnt by this, and he did not want to go this again. He had lived it with his people. God had blessed a, an evil king, and the king became more evil instead of becoming good. And so I believe Jonah, being a man of God, said, you know what? I can't bear this anymore. I can't bear God being so good and people being so evil. I can't bear it anymore. I can't bring a message to people that are just going to take advantage of God's grace. I don't know if you ever felt like that. Has anyone here ever felt like that before you? Right? That you, you, can't, you know that this person needs to repent, be right with God, and you want them to do it, and you bring a message of hope. You say, God can forgive you. God can, and he will. And, and you see their lives, maybe momentarily, they're open to the reality, and God blesses their lives, and, and sort of things begin to change. But sooner than later, sooner rather than later, they go back to their evil ways. And you go, what was that about? <laughs> what did, why? Lord, why did I even go? I mean, now that person is whatever you, th you know, just whatever. Whatever, they're, they're back to evil, and probably even worse now. Why did I go? And Jonah felt the same way. I believe Jonah really loved God, really had a heart for God, but he really didn't have a heart for people. And he understood that people are fickle, and people don't follow through, and people don't really love God. They just love his benefits. And he'd rather not go tell people that are going to abuse it. And if you're going to tell somebody that they're going to follow the Lord and they're going to turn around and maybe even accept God's grace and mercy and be, maybe they get out of an issue or God blesses them and God rescues them out of a problem, but then they go right back to sin. Jonah says, no, burned once, not going to do it again. I'm not going to Nineveh because I know God's good, but people are not. And therefore, I'd rather not go and tell them and run the other way. 
And that's why the story is, go back to Jonah. Jonah 4, that's why he says, didn't I tell you when I was in the country, in our own country, back in, back in Israel, when you told me to go, I did not want to go because of this. This very thing was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. You are too good to people. You run to forgive. And, and you don't, he's almost trying to lecture God. You don't understand people, God. You know, God, people are really kind of bad. <laughs> did you know what happened in Israel? It's going to happen again. I just can't bear it. And, you know, I, I think this is a good test. How much do we really love God? Because if you really love God, I think it would hurt. Wouldn't it hurt when you see people taking advantage of God's mercy? Yes. Yes. He hurt. I mean, it burns me sometimes with anger, but it, it, it should hurt. You know, people wave their flags and all kinds of colors and rainbows, and they take advantage of God's mercy and say, oh, God's forgiven me, and I'm good, and I'm just going to, you know, be proud of who I am. And, and you're like, oh, God's not for that. And why are you taking advantage of God's name like that? And it does burn with anger. And we'd rather go, you know what? I don't know. I don't care anymore. I'm not going to tell them, because all they're going to do is go back to their lives again. And that's exactly what Jonah felt. I just want to die. I don't want to go this anymore. You brought me into a ship, out of a ship, into, a, into the water, into a fish, vomited me, out, vomited, me, vomited me out, go to the shore, preach a message. I come back. People repent. I had it, Lord. I don't want to go this again. This is too much. You kind of see the frustration building up. I want to die. Have we ever heard a prophet ever say that? No? Let's turn to the book of 1 Kings now. Let's go to 1 Kings, and let's go to chapter 19. It is the exact story, in a very interesting way, of Elijah. Elijah said the same thing, kind of an interesting thing. At the peak of their ministry, you would say. At the peak of their ministry. At the peak of the greatest thing that they've ever happened to them. The way it had happened to Elijah was quite different. Chapter 19. I'll give you the background. Elijah is a prophet of God during one of the worst kings they ever had, Ahab and Jezebel, the queen. Elijah preaching, and he goes, and he, he takes everybody to Mount Carmel. Right? The, the great, I mean, it's a fascinating story. If you see it in a movie, it's fascinating. He's got the 400 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah, and he says, all right, let's have a contest. The real God is going to win. If the real God is going to answer by fire, you build your altar, I'll build my altar, you put your sacrifice, I'll put my sacrifice. The God who answers by fire wins. And they started all this thing, right? They started all their dancing and chanting. By the way, we know now from archaeology that in those pagan nations, when they ever they made a sacrifice with fire, they found underground tunnels, by the way, where the priests would go under the tunnels and light the fire underneath and fool everybody. They already proved it. Archaeologically, you, you know, they built underground tunnels to, to do this. The fact that they were doing it wasn't too unknown to, the, to that world. Everybody did it. The God who built, who answers by fire was going to win. They thought, it's easy. We've always done it, and we always fool the people. We're going to win. The different thing was that God did not let that happen. They chanted. They did their thing. They cut themselves. Nothing. What did Elijah do? Take the sacrifice. Put water on it. Soak it again, again, again. And you notice the fire did not come from underneath. Fire came from above. And he licked up the sacrifice, the altar, and the water. You ever seen fire licked up water like that? Amazing. Elijah says, all right, apprehend these false guys and kill them. Kill them all at the peak of his ministry. But then something happens. It says in chapter 19, Ahab told Jezebel what Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah. You may the God, uh, so may the gods do to me and even more if I don't do if I not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. And he was afraid. He got up and he went to Beersheba, and he, uh, which belongs to Judah, and he left the servant there. And he went himself a day's journey into the wilderness, came down, sat under the juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. That's it. Lord, I had it. It is enough, Lord. 
I'm done. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Look at verse 9. Then he came to a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came, and he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And it says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of Israel, the sons of uh, the God of hosts, the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, turned thine altars, and kill your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and they seek my life to take it away. I'm done. At the peak of his ministry, Elijah has a breakdown. And he says, take my life, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Why did he say that? Well, I think if you, if you read the whole context of it, he got to the point where we realize, Lord, I don't know if Israel's really repented. They've seen it. They've seen your great power. But I don't know if it went deep enough because I'm the only one left. After all the great things that you did, I'm the only one left that's really yours. And God says, no, 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 no. There's 7,000 left. You got that wrong, Elijah. But the depression that came upon Elijah, same as Jonah, take my life, it's over. Why? God, I don't know if people get it. That was Elijah's response. Lord, I don't know if it went deep enough. I, I, know you, I know they saw it, half a million people in Mount Carmel. I know they saw your great power, but did they really change? Did they really go forward? Did they really make sense to them that you're the real God? Did they have any fruit of repentance? I don't know. I'm done. I don't want to go back. It's too tiresome. Jonah, same thing. Lord, I know you're going to forgive them, but I don't know if they're going to follow through with that. I don't know if they're really going to repent. I know you will forgive, but these people are not going to repent. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it went down deep enough in their hearts. And I don't know if Israel's going to repent. I don't know if Nineveh's going to repent. I know you're going to forgive, but I don't know if people are going to really be faithful to you. So that's why I don't want to go. Take my life. This is over. In a small way, can I, can I share with you something real quick, real personal? In a small way, in a very, very small way, I've had moments like that. You know, Great service, great Sunday. People are interested. People are asking questions. People seem to respond. Seems fine. But then two days later, I get news or I hear something or I hear somebody call me or an email about something that was said or someone that wasn't responding the right way or their behavior was so, so different. And I go, what happened? What happened between Sunday and Tuesday? How did they go from that to this? And you know what I've said? I said, Lord, I don't know if I'm getting through. I have no idea if all that I do is any worth to anybody. Are these messages just, I mean, does anyone even care for them? I know people tell me, I don't care what you do. I don't like what you do. I don't like the studies. And that's fine. Nobody has to like them. We're not building a cult here. But the reality of it is, does it really matter? And I've had moments like that where it's just like, you know what? I don't even ever want to do this anymore. Yeah, you go through the headache. You, t you tell people. You share with people. You, you, you pour your heart out to them. You study. You pray. You do it over and over again and week in and week out. And then people come, and then they fight, and then they argue, and then they don't get along. And it's like, did they not been listening for a year? <laughs> do they really care? Do they really even understand what the Bible is about? I know people want to know about the Bible, at least sometimes they do, but do they really care what it's about? Because right? it's one thing knowing what the, uh, what, you know, about the Bible. A lot of people like to know about the Bible, but do they know what the Bible is about, ultimately? And I've had moments like that, and I could identify with Elijah, or maybe even Jonah. I don't know if I want to keep going, Lord. I keep preaching and teaching, and it seems like nothing changes. Nothing happens. People just come, they smile, and they go home. And then the week comes, and then they're the same. Nothing's changed. Their behavior's the same. They're still mean to their wives. They still don't love their husbands. They still don't love their wives. They don't respect each other. They don't love each other. They fight. They argue. They gossip. What's the point? And you feel like quitting because you feel like you've made zero impact in people's lives. And that's what Jonah was like. Look, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Take my life. Go back. Are we back to Jonah? Yeah. The depression set in. Jonah said, that's it. Take my life. I don't want to go. This is too much. I'm not there yet. I'm going to go back. So let's keep going because I lost my place. There it is. Verse 4. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry, Jonah? Do you have good reason? Are you sure you're right about this? I love when 
See, the Lord is so good. And he's done that to me. He doesn't smash me down. He doesn't just go, you have no idea what you're talking about. He just asked the question, are you sure? Are you sure you know what you're talking about? Um, is it right for you to be angry? Because you seem to know a lot about people, Jonah. But do you know enough about me? Do you know enough about them? So verse 5, then, he went to, uh, then Jonah went out from the city and sat on the east side of it. So all these details are important because the east side of the city is further from his home, right? The western side would have been closer to Jerusalem. As you move east, you move away from Jerusalem. So just think on those little nuances, right? He just wants to move away, you know? It's like, um, no offense to anybody sitting in the back, but it would have been someone like that, right? There's an issue, and you just want to sit way in the back. You, know, you have somebody way in the back back there, and you go, what's that brother doing back there? You know, he should come in here. Little nuances, right, in the scripture. He sat on the east side of it, further and further away from Jerusalem. It's like he didn't want to be, didn't want to be close to that. He climbed on this hill, and what does he do? He made himself a shelter, literally a booth, which is quite interesting because uh, it was during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, if we have our time correctly, that um, the Yom Kippur, Jonah's read during Yom Kippur, and then it goes right into uh, the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which was just a couple of weeks ago. He builds a booth, and it's quite a fascinating story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story about uh, Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, but it's a fascinating study in terms of it reflects, it reflects God's kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus, the millennial reign. You get out of your home, you build a booth, you're out there for seven days, you make your booth out of branches or trees or leaves or whatever you can find, and that's what Jonah did. And uh, as you look up at the stars, you read the book of Ecclesiastes. Fascinating book. And you wonder, why would they read the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, it makes all sense in the world if you know what the book of Ecclesiastes is about. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. doesn't matter. Any, nothing matters unless you know the Lord. And you live, in a, you live in a booth. It's a temporary dwelling. Just like the children of Israel in the desert, it was just a temporary dwelling before they entered the promised land. It was to remind them every year. Remember how you were a slave? Remember how you went into the wilderness? Remember you, go live in a booth. Go live in a tent for a week and realize you're just a pilgrim in this place. There's really, really nothing. Nothing is, everything's temporary. What's important is the eternal. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. It tells you, focus on the eternal. This world, vanity, all is vanity. Jonah built a booth. And he's saying, I'm going to be pretty comfortable here. I'm going to sit and look at the city. And uh, he sat under it so he could see what would happen in the city. What did he expect to see? Question for you. What did he expect to see in the city? What? Vanity. People going back to their ways. Yeah. I'm just going to sit here, God, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to look because I know people. I know what they're going to do. It's just like Israel. They're going to sin. And then you're going to judge them, right? You're going to do something about it, right, God? Because they're, I mean, I know, I know people. They're just going to go back to their evil ways. Don't you know your people, Israel? They did the same thing. People are people. People are the same. Jonah, right? Looking at them. And he goes and he sits. And by the way, was Jonah right? Was Jonah right about Nineveh? Think about it, though. Did they return to their sin? Yeah. Technically, maybe a couple. Yeah. Technically, Jonah wasn't too far off the truth. People are going to go back to their sin. Uh, by the way, God sends another messenger to Nineveh 150 years later. Anybody know who that is? He sent the prophet to that area. Again, 150 years after Jonah. His name was Nahum. Nahum. The prophet Nahum. And by the way, Nahum's message, I think Sergio preached on Nahum here uh, when he did the Minor Prophets. Um, Nahum's message was pretty straightforward. You've sinned. You're a harlot. I'm going to show the world your nakedness, and I'm going to judge you and destroy you because you've had your chance, and you're full of, full of idols, full of idolatry, full of demonic things, and full of immorality, and you've had your chance, and it's over. It's not that God won't deal with sin. People presume on the grace of God as if he's okay with sin. It's not that he's okay with it. It's just that he is very patient with people. 
Jonah wanted it done now. You see them sinning, Lord? Get rid of them. You see them getting wrong things? Get them out. Get them out of the church. Get them out. Of, we got to get rid of them. God says, no. I'm going to give them 150 years. Now, he didn't say that, but that's what God really did. He gave them 150 more years to get it right. Now, if you and I would have been like, this is crazy. I never would give people a week, <laughs> let alone 150 years. Jonah says, watch, they're going to sin. And he sits there, and he is going to have his way, right? Jonah knew human nature, but he missed on God's nature. Human nature is fickle. People... Stop repenting. People go back to their sins. That is true. But does God get rid of them right there and then? No. See, he was right about men. He was wrong about God. And that's the thing about Jonah that it's so important. Yes, he was right about Nineveh. It was short-lived, you would say. 150 years, maybe it's not that short. But eventually God, his righteousness, met sin and God got rid of sin. Amen. But God was merciful, and Jonah could not understand that part. And so he built his booth. It's the midday sun. He sets it up, verse 6. That then the Lord appointed a plant to grow over to Jonah, over, uh, over to Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from the discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about it. Now, this is the word great again. He was greatly excited. Gadol, he was very happy about the plant. But then in verse 7, but God appointed a worm. See the but again? But God. He appointed a worm. And the worm came down the next day and, it sta and attacked the plant and it withered and it came about when the sun came up that God appointed, again, a scorching wind, an east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his souls to die again, saying, death is better to me than life. Now, we got some interesting things here. God prepares, this is fascinating. God prepares a plant. Joe, it, it must have gotten very hot during this time. The little shade, the little, whatever Jonah built didn't last long. Now, just keep that in mind because it builds on this story. Whatever Jonah provided for himself did not last. God provides him something of nature, a plant. But then God sends a worm, and it kills the plant, and Jonah becomes angry again. And he's really had it. That's it, Lord. Now you gave me a plant and it was all good. But now you take away the plant. What are you doing to me? I'm left with a worm. Now what was so unique about the worm? Now the word warm here, uh, just very quickly because i got to finish. It's the word tola. Tola. T-O-L-A. Uh, some people end it with an H, but that's fine. Tola. And it's the word for... Also, the word for crimson, the word for crimson, like red. In Hebrew, the word for tola, a worm, and the word for crimson, red, it's interchangeable. They can use this. It's the same word. Why? It's a unique thing. By the way, the, the, the priest would get the dye from the worm to make the red. Like in the, in the Yom Kippur story, the Yom Kippur scapegoat goat, they would tie a sash, a red sash, around the horns of the goat. The priest and their garments, the crimson red came from this worm, and it was called the tola. Now, this, this, this worm is very interesting. It grows a lot in Israel, and it was an interesting worm because if you crush the worm, it will actually give you this deep dye red that some people said it would last forever. Like if you, you take your, your clothes or you take your cloth and you dip it in this you know, you boil the, the worm, you boil it. You, I've been to Thailand when they do the silkworms. It's fascinating. I could imagine what they did. You boil the worms, and, the, and then you crush them, and then this dye comes out, and you dip your clothes or you dip your cloth in there, and it stays red almost forever. There's no way you can get this out. And that is the word tola. This is the worm that comes over. Jonah eats the plant, and all Jonah's left with is, Look, I had a shelter. I had a, a big plant over me, maybe a castor, oil, a castor oil plant. They grow very fast in that area. And it's gone, and all I'm left is with a worm that produces red dye. Now, he might not have known that it produced red dye, but this was something that the Levitical priest had done for a long time. 
What's interesting about this worm, and this is the fascinating part about it, by the way, you can read uh, Exodus 26. It is mentioned over and over again. The word red, the word crimson, the word tola, over and over again. Uh, the, the veil of the curtain of the tabernacle was red from this worm that was crushed and it would give up this red dye. What's fascinating about this worm, too, in, in, natural, in natural settings, the worm goes up a tree, just like you see here, and gives the eggs. And this moth right, goes up the tree, gives this eggs, and right before the eggs hatch, the worm or the, 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 the moth dies. It, it, it actually uh, hangs on a tree and it dies. And when it dies, it gives out this, this red color and it goes onto the eggs or the larva that is, on, uh, that is on, the, on the tree. And it sustains the larva until they're old enough to get out and become moth. And this is what the tola does. Once it dies, fascinating enough, a few days later, some commentators say three days later, it turns completely white, and you can take the resin of this moth and take it home and use it as preservative. Fascinating worm. Now, what does it have to do with anything? Turn to Je uh, Isaiah chapter 1, please. Isaiah chapter 1, very quickly. We're just about done. Remember I told you the word crimson? And the word tola and the word red or the word for warm is the same one. Well, we'll find a passage here that is very used to. Many Christians know this verse. But I may not know that that word comes up here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. God is dealing with Israel's sins. And he says to Israel in chapter 1, verse 18. If I can find it. There it is. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like tola, crimson, they shall be white as wool or white as snow. The tola, the worm, the crimson. What does this crimson have to do with anything? Turn to Psalm 22. It has something to do with red on a tree. Psalm 22 says this, out of the mouth of Jesus. I am a tola. Psalm 22, verse 6. I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and the spies of the people. Jesus made reference that he is that worm. Yet yeah, we have the seven I am statements in John. This is the other one in Psalms. And we know from the, the Gospels, Jesus would have quoted the psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, it was quite interesting. There's, uh, there's five different, uh, seven different prophecies in this psalm just about what Jesus said, you know, regarding his crucifixion, the nails pierced hands, not a broken bone, the garments are divided, people are casting lots his, for his robe, uh, people are mocking him, uh, water is gushing from his side. All these things are Psalm 22. But he says, I am a tola. I am a worm. I am that worm that the Levitical priesthood has used for thousands of years to create this red crimson dye that goes on the door of the tabernacle. Right? The entrance of the tabernacle is crimson red. As almost to say, nobody goes in through that tabernacle unless through Christ. You can't meet God unless you go through the crimson tabernacle, the crimson curtains. Right? It's the same dye that is in the crimson sash of the Yom Kippur scapegoat, right? That many times the Jews said would turn white. Um, once the, the sins were forgiven, they believed that it turned white. And they have history that it said it, it turns white. <laughs> Just like Isaiah 118, the crimson, though your sins be as scarlet and crimson, they shall be white as snow. I am that Tola, Jesus said. And so the Tola is a type, really a big shadow of the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is that worm. That worm. That worm in, in Exodus, that worm in Psalm 22. Go back to Jonah, because he says, there was a worm that came over Jonah, Tola. And all Jonah's left with, it's a worm. The plant's gone, his booth is gone. He has a worm that is dye 
It's basically crimson. It's the word for crimson. And God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plan? And he says, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Verse 10, the Lord said, you had compassion on the plan for which you did not work for, in which you did not cause it to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Jonah, you can have compassion over natural things, natural life. But I think about other things. Verse 11, should I not have compassion over Nineveh, the great city in which there were 120,000 people who did not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand? See, God is not angry with Jonah. He's just talking to Jonah, but he's correcting him. Him who God loves, he corrects. Jonah, you're wrong. You're wrong about me. You have compassion on things that are temporary. Life, natural life. I have compassion on people that will live forever. In one or two places. God has compassion on people. Innocent people. They don't know their left hand from their right hand. That's another way of saying they don't know what they're doing. They don't know if what they're doing is wrong. Does that sound like something that Jesus said? While on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Now, Jesus knew what they were doing. And Jesus knows what sin is and what is not. There's not it's not saying God doesn't know. But God chooses to deal with people on the basis of his mercy and not on the basis of sin. He can do that. Because he's God. He can have compassion. And he can look at those people in Nineveh and says, I know that they deserve judgment. I know they deserve hell. I know they deserve all these things because of what they've done. I know it. But I choose to relate to them on the, verse, on the basis of mercy and compassion, not on judgment. Jonah was the opposite. I just want you to get rid of them. God says, no, I'm not going to get rid of them. I'm going to give them 150 years. Why? Jonah, you had this worm over you. You didn't know this, but you had a worm. That worm is not your covering. That worm is now over you. Not the plant, not your booth, but the worm. Signifies Christ, but more specifically, the cross. Because remember, that's the tree that the, that the worm has to die that, and leaves that crimson stain. What you have over you, Jonah, is the cross. What you and I have now is the cross. We may have great, great desire for the natural life, right? You have a good life. You live a good life. You have good things. But you know, God wants us to focus really on the new life. And the new life sometimes is not so exciting, isn't it? The new life kind of makes us frustrated at times. Pick up your cross and follow him. Lord, it seems so much easier to live the natural life. It seems so much easier to live just my regular life. Why do I have to live this crucified life? Because that's really the way to live. That's really the way to know God. It's only through the cross. And Jonah had to learn this incredible lesson that God can have mercy on people because Jesus has paid it all. Jesus can relate to us today on the basis of his love and mercy and compassion, even when he should have casted us off a long time ago. He should have got rid of us. He should have just said, look, I told you a thousand times and a thousand times you keep coming back. Though a righteous man falls seven times, the Lord picks him up again. You fall a hundred times, get up a hundred and one times. And you know one thing, God will receive you back. Why? Because he's merciful. He has compassion. I don't sometimes <laughs> toward people. I think, you know, that's enough. You know, what, you know, what's up with that guy? It's enough is enough. Get rid of him. I don't think that way. But, you know, you, you feel that way sometimes. Like, oh my, when is he going to get it? When is this over? When is he going to really be right? And God says, you know what? I'm not giving up on him. I'm not giving up on Nineveh. I'm not giving up on those of you have given up on. And so out of the sheer mercy and grace, God supplies all that Ninevite needed. For 150 years, God kept them around. And the book ends, by the way. It just ends like that. They don't know what they're doing. 
Don't I have compassion over those and over the animals, God says. And the book ends like that. Now, here's the question. Why does it end like that? Chapter, I told you chapter 4 is a little interesting because it just ends. Anybody have any thoughts on why does it end just like that? Open-ended. Okay. I, maybe, I, maybe I should ask you this question. Did Jonah respond? Yeah. Well, the question is, did Jonah respond in the right way? He did. No, but beyond chapter 4, I'm just saying, beyond chapter 4, like if there was a verse 11, oh, uh, verse 12, right? There's no verse 12, but if there was a verse 12, will it say, Jonah realized that the Lord is right, went back to his hometown and preached the gospel until the end of his life, right? That's what I would like to see it end. I don't know. Maybe he did. I give you one hint. We have the book of Jonah. There is no way Jonah uh, wasn't involved in the writing of this book. Either he wrote it himself or he dictated it to a priest or a scribe that wrote it, inspired by the Lord, and to have the book. Because all the details are here. Nobody knew this. There's nobody that knew the story except Jonah. So he's the one telling the story. Because we have the book, it's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? I think Jonah left all the details there because I think maybe Jonah got it right. But that's not the point. It, the reason it ends like that is because the book of Jonah is not finished yet. It's like a parable, but it's a real story. It ends like a parable, I should say. Who's going to finish that story? And you can write in your Bible, and you can write in your Bible, even today. How would I respond? Do I have patience for people? Do I have compassion for people? Do I have compassion for people that after they messed up so many times and I keep going back to them and back to them and back to them, or do I want to get rid of them? Do I really know God and how merciful and compassionate he really is toward people? Or is he like me, quick-tempered, hot-tempered, get rid of them, that's it, I don't put up with anything? I have a hard time imagining that God is like me. Because he is full of mercy, and he's very patient. But that's the book of Jonah. That's, shouldn't the Lord have mercy on people? Shouldn't the Lord have mercy on California, on New York, on the States? We would like to say, yeah. Well, yeah. But what about the people that have hurt you and don't respond well? That to this day still haven't responded well. Let's finish the study. We can talk about it because I know that, that we have a recording and then they can't hear Frank. So, um, yeah, but let's talk about that because I think you and I have to finish that story. I don't know how Jonah ended, and I really have no idea, but I know how I could end, and you know how you could end, and you can respond to God's mercy and grace in the same way, or you could be a Jonah. And in the last days, it's going to be very, very clear. The church needs to stop being Jonah and get back to our first love. And I guess the question is, are we Jonah? I see a lot of characteristics of Jonah in me. I see it in the church. And before the Lord comes, there needs to be a real repentance, a real power of the Holy Spirit that only comes from real repentance, real death experience, real resurrection. It's the only way we're going to get back to the Ninevehs of our lives. But God wants to change our hearts too. He's interested in Nineveh. He's interested in your heart and how you're going to respond. Deep book, isn't it? Fascinating story of a man 
We don't even have an end to the book. How did it end? I think God left it that way so that you and I can fill in the blanks. Let's pray. Lord, we believe your word. We believe everything that's in this book and what Jonah endured is real and it happened. We thank you, Lord, that you are merciful and compassionate. Lord, I like when you're merciful and compassionate to me. I like when you're patient with me. Lord, help me to be patient with others and merciful to others and compassionate to others in the midst of even, even when they're not following you. Help us, Lord, to have your mercy and compassion. Help us, Lord, to see people as you see it, Lord, as you see them. And Lord, help us to have patience and mercy toward one another and love and in truth, Lord. We pray that you help us to do this, Lord. Pray that you help us grow and you help us to finish this book that we would say, yes, Lord, you are that way. You are merciful and you are compassionate and you are slow to anger and faithful to love. Help me to be that. For Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you guys. Um, We'll take a quick little break here.